I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check and battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. Before we get to the episode, I just want to talk real quick. I'm sure if you've listened to any other episodes, you've heard me talk about Treeline Academy. And you can go to treelineacademy.net to enroll yourself in the most comprehensive e-scouting course or masterclass that you've ever, ever signed up for. It's the most detailed, detail-oriented. I can't even state how detail-oriented Mark Livesey is when it comes to this class. And it will vastly, vastly improve your e-scouting for all of your hunting adventures. So um, like I said before, you can go to uh, Treeline Academy and use the promo code PC2020 and save yourself 20 bucks. And now let's get to the episode. All right, so I'm sitting here and I have got Clay Hayes on the line and we're going to talk about all kinds of things. If you don't know who he is, you're about to find out. Clay, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, well, uh, Clay, obviously, my I'm a, a traditional bow hunter, a bow builder, a wildlife biologist, uh, and a bunch of other things. I do a lot of uh, a lot of instructional stuff on YouTube, and that's probably where most people would know me from is the the traditional archery and bow hunting content on YouTube. So, I mean. Let's talk about it, Clay. Did you grow up hunting? How did, what did, what did you do? I, I kind of grew up hunting, but then again, I kind of didn't. Um, my, my dad is not a hunter, uh, and I didn't really have any guidance, uh, in to get into hunting when I was young. I've got two older brothers and both of them have hunted a little bit, but they're not, they never stuck with it and they never really hunted seriously. Uh, but for some reason i was just consumed with it you know when i was a kid and i was always in the woods i was always drawn to uh to hunting and uh and so i didn't i kind of got into hunting differently than most people uh you know most people are introduced it introduced to it through their family through their fathers uh, things like that and i didn't have that and so i kind of came at hunting from a little bit different way i i got into uh, you know, kind of like bushcrafting and primitive skills type stuff. And I had a, I had BB guns and things like that when I was a kid, but I never had any rifles. I never had any deer rifles or anything like that. And so when I started hunting seriously, uh, I got a compound bow when I was probably 15. I think, uh, I got it as a Christmas present and I hunted with that for till I was I think 17 or 18 and that's when I started making self bows. Um, and I, I started hunting with self bows. I think like the fourth or fifth one that I made, I started hunting with that and I sold the compound and I've been doing that ever since. And that was 1998 or 1999. And so here I am. So you, you got a book, right? Is that, you got a book and that's what started you on that path? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd tried to make bows. Uh, I'd always been interested in it because I was interested in those primitive skills type stuff. Um, and I had tried to make bows unsuccessfully. Um, and it wasn't until I found that, the traditional bowyer's Bible. And that was, you know, during that time period uh, when I was in high school. And that ga- that kind of laid it out for me. It gave me the, the proper instruction on on how to do things. And that's what 
you know, gave me the instruction to be able to make a bow that I, that would, that would shoot. Um, and then after I got a couple under my belt, I, I was, I started making bows that I felt comfortable, uh, hunting with. So how many, how many did it take before you actually got one that wouldn't shock your hand or, you know, all the things that everybody else does, you know, when they're building a bow? I, you know, it's been so long ago. I, I remember the first bow that I made, I shot it maybe two or three times before it broke. And then I think I made probably a dozen after that, that would shoot, but they were not, you know, they did, just didn't perform very well. They stacked a lot. They, I don't remember a bunch of hand shock, but I probably didn't know any different, you know, at that time. I, I probably just thought that that's the way they were supposed to shoot. Um, but the big thing is that, you know, I've been making bows now for, you know, 20 years and it, like, I still, I, my, my bow building still progresses. I still learn things with each bow that I make. Um, and they continue to get better. And so, uh, now, you know, I can make a bow that will perform just as good as any, you know, factory built glass bow on the market. It's, it's kind of, it's tough to beat the performance of a nice custom bow, but, uh, most of the, most of the, uh, most of the factory bows, I can build a bow that will shoot just as fast and just as sweet as any of those things. So when you say you're going to build it just as fast, are you adding like a reflex deflex to the limbs then, or, uh, you just, you building it to where it's got enough, uh, draw weight or something? No, I mean, so when you, the, the standard for testing, for comparing bows is to shoot a, a 10 grain per pound arrow. So if you're shooting a 50 pound bow, you're going to be shooting a 500 grain arrow. And so I could take a bear Montana or a, any of the bear recurves or, um, anything like that, 50 pounds. And I could build a bow that's 50 pounds that would shoot faster than those bows. Um, there's a number of things that you can do to, to do that. Um, putting reflex or recurve in the limb tips, um, heat treating the bellies to harden that belly wood and make it more resistant to compression, uh, increase that cast. Um, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do to wood to make it, uh, perform better. So you, those are just things you learned along the way or how, how did you, uh, come to discover those things? You, you learn things as you go. Uh, and then there's also, there's a bunch of people out there that are building bows. There's a great community around boat building and, you know, like with anything, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like hearsay and wives tales type things. Uh, but the longer you're in there, the more you'll figure out. Um, but there's a lot of guys out there that are very helpful. You know, if you have a question on a particular species of wood or a particular design that you're trying to figure out, you know, you can post those questions to some of the forums and get some, some good feedback. Uh, and you can, you can pretty quickly figure out the guys that really know what they're talking about versus the guys that, you know, are just talking. So let's, uh, where'd you grow up then that when you were in high school, you were cutting down, cutting down trees or whatever you're doing to get, get all those staves. I'm sure you were whacking a bunch of trees down somewhere. Yep. I grew up uh, on a ranch in Northwest Florida and the, I guess probably the first two dozen bows that I made were all made out of common persimmon, which is a, a really common tree uh, down in that part of the country. And I didn't see my first piece of Osage, which is primarily what I build bows out of now, until I'd been building bows for a year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, I, I, that's, so I'd been building bows for about that long year, year and a half. And, and then I met another fella that was also building bows. And he was only, I'd say, 15 miles from me. Uh, in Northwest Florida. And he gave me my first piece of Osage. Uh, and then we kind of just struck up a friendship and we've been, been friends ever since. Cool. That's pretty cool. So what's your preferred wood now then? I, Osage hands down. Yeah. Uh, Pacific U is, is a really good bow wood, but as far as just a, a practical, good performing bow, uh, bow wood for a self bow, Osage is it. I mean, that stuff is just so durable and it just, it, it's easy to work. Um, and you can make a really, really nice bow out of it. We've got a lot of, a lot of Osage here in Illinois. Most of it yeah. isn't too straight, but 
every once in a while you get pretty lucky. I got a buddy that hacked down a pretty big chunk of it on his property, and I bet you he's got probably 15 staves sitting in his shed. So maybe one day I'll grab one of them. Um, which kind of brings me to some of my next questions then. Um, if somebody were to get into this, what would you recommend as far as uh, like books to read or or uh, tools that they would kind of need or need to build? Um, well, I'm going to plug my own stuff. Uh, <laughs> Go right so ahead. I've got, a, I've got a book, the traditional Bowyer's Handbook, uh, that's very detailed. And then I've also got a uh, three-disc uh, DVD set, which is very, very detailed, uh, probably the most detailed set of videos out there uh, that deals with uh, building self bows. And then I've got also my Patreon site where I have all of those videos plus a whole bunch of other videos like how to send you back bows, uh, tiller and recurves and things like that. Um, but in addition to that, I mean, the, the traditional Billiards Bible, it was published, I think, in the early 90s. But it's still, I mean, boat building really hasn't, it's, it's building a 50,000 year old weapon. So it really hasn't changed all that much. The information in that book is, um, is, is very good as well. Um, but other than that, just, just go, pe- one of the, one of the things that people, one of the mistakes that people make, I think is that when they get into bow building, they want to build the perfect bow on their first time. And it's like bow building is a journey. I mean, I just said uh, a few minutes ago that I'm, I've been building them for 20 years and I'm still learning. I mean, there's no end to the amount of stuff that you can learn. And so my biggest suggestion was just be to go cut down a tree or go to Home Depot and get a maple board and just start building bows because your your first one is not going to be a perfect bow. You're going to learn a lot on it and the next one's going to be a little better and the next one's going to be a little better. I mean, it's just a progression over time. So would you recommend somebody like cutting the riser on a bandsaw or would you tell them to take like a draw knife and tiller it down? Um, well, I, I learned to build bows with the tools that I had, which was basically a farrier's rasp and an old draw knife. And I still, to this day, primarily use those two tools. You could build, uh, once you get your stave split, you can build an entire bow with just those two tools and that's all you need. Um, and so it's not like it's a major investment. Now, if, you, if you're starting to build board bows, which is a great way for people to get into it because you don't have to have access to go and cut a tree, you don't have to buy an expensive stave. You know, you can go to Home Depot and get a, a $10 uh, hard maple or red oak, uh, like one by two, and start making a bow out of that. And if you're going to go that route, then a block plane, uh, just a little hand plane is probably what you'll use mostly if you do have a bandsaw you could certainly use it but you don't have to have it right so so basically the basic tools you'd need is like a draw knife and a farrier's rasp and then maybe like a piece of banding or something for a scraper for fine tuning or what what would you you use like a um i mean i I, now my tool selection or my tool kit has expanded a lot um but when i first started i literally a draw knife and a farrier's rasp because I would, I would use my draw knife as my scraper. I'd just turn it up on edge and use it that way. Um, now, you know, I've got cabinet scrapers and I've got a uh, bow scales and I've got uh, a little compass to scribe the lines on the sides and all of that stuff. And it all comes in handy, but it's, it, it doesn't, you don't have to have that. Okay. What, what do your students use when, uh, when they come in and learn from you? I'll see if I can run down the list. Um, primarily, they're, they're going to use a draw knife and uh, a set of rasps. So they'll have a farrier's rasp and then like a Nicholson number 49 or Nicholson number 50. It's a round, half round rasp. Um, we'll use a, a little compass that'll hold a, a fine tip Sharpie. Uh, we'll use that to scribe the limb thickness uh, and help to lay out the bow. Uh, we use a... Uh, tape measure to to lay out the bow and get the handle and everything in the right position and to taper the limb tips. So we we uh, take the limb tips and break them into two inch sections um, and taper them out. Oh, what else? Uh, bow scale will come in very handy, and you can get a bow scale for probably I don't know twenty five bucks or something like that. 
Uh, I've got a tillering rack that I made where you put the bow up against the wall and you can stand back and pull on it just to see how those limbs are bending in relation to one another. Um, cabinet scrapers, sandpaper, and I'm probably leaving something out, but that's that's the majority of it. Pretty and uh, when, when they come and build this, you're, you're giving them a raw stave and going from there? or How, how does that work? Yep. Yeah, so I've got uh, I got a barn full of staves, and we go out there and just, you know, they can pick whatever they want. Um, some people want a really clean stave. Uh, some people are wanting, you know, maybe they've built a couple of bows before, and they're looking for something with a little bit more character, so they want something with some knots and twists and, and snaky grain. So, you know, we pick out whatever they want, and then, you know, I'll take a look at the stave with them and talk to them about, you know, what are the characteristics of this stave? What are some of the things uh, that to look out for? Uh, maybe some of the potential problems that they might run into that they're going to have to navigate. Uh, and so, you know, it, the whole class starts with stave selection and, and what to look for in a good stave. And how long does it take the, the class? Is it like three, four days or, or a week or what? Yeah. So, uh Right now, we're doing two different uh, options. We're doing uh, a, a one piece, uh, which takes three days. And then uh, we have a five-day option where you can build a two-piece takedown bow. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do that again next year. We'll have to see uh, over the winter if we're going to pick up the five-day again. Uh, but we may go just to the two, uh, to the three-day class. Okay. And then, uh, so when... Uh what what kind of led you to go this whole i mean we talked about it a little bit but like as far primitive as you did was that from the start that was your idea and you started making your own strings right off the bat or were you buying dacron what what did you do that that led you down that path or or the decision that you made to go so primitive i think it was just something that was in me something you know inherent and i I didn't have any in, I didn't have any outside influence, um, you know, from a father that would have been, uh, that was hunter, that was a hunter. Um, and so I already had that interest in, in primitive skills and bushcraft and things like that. And that's just the direction that I went with, with my hunting. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to make bows. I started making bows and, you know, they were, they were good enough. I felt like to hunt with. And so I started making, I, I started making them. I started hunting with them. And for me, it's always been hunting. Like meat is very important to me. Like, especially now I have a, I have two boys, I have a family of four and we eat a lot of wild game meat. And so it's important that I fill my freezer every year. But I think just as important as that for me is the experience of being out there and being challenged and feeling like I am hunting that animal on as level a playing field as I can. And, and, and for me personally, traditional archery and, and primitive archery is, is the way that I do that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so were you, were you right off the bat then making your own strings with your bow then? Yeah, I've always, well, when I first got into this, I didn't have any money. You know, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't have any money to, that's why I had the, such a simple toolkit. I didn't have the money to buy the tools. I didn't have the money to buy strings or buy a bow. I just made everything myself. And I, I've always been able to do that. Like I can, you know, I can, um, I've just been able to do things with my hands. Um, and so that's just, that's what I did. But what was I your, made? I started. Go I ahead. Was, I was going to say, well, what was your sh first string made from? Then was it actual sinew? And if that's the case, did you hunt I, the animal a different way, or did you get it from a friend that hunted an animal or something? You know, I went. No, I was. I got. Uh, I think I bought a spool of B fifty or something like that, which was probably at, at that time only about ten bucks or twelve bucks. Um. And I made my strings out of that for a while. And then I think right about, it would have been 2002 or 2003, I got 
I like went even more primitive. I started making stone points and sinew strings, uh, brain tan and buckskins and like full on caveman. Uh, and I did that until I had kids <laughs> and, uh, and when that, when, when they came, all of that went away because it's, I mean, to make that, to, to make all the stuff in that way, you know, just to make one arrow shaft is hours of work, you know, and, and you, you know, as well as anybody, you just can't afford to spend that kind of time, you know, when you got kids running around. <laughs> That's yeah. I was, in fact, I was just listening to, uh, Clay, Clay Newcomb and Sean Spicer the other day, and they were talking about napping primitive points and stuff. And they were talking about how some look so much better than others. And you sit there and you wonder whether or not it was a little kid learning how to do it and sitting there, or, you know, maybe it was just a guy that had to make his own versus to where there was like a master napper within the tribe or, you know, the group of paleo Indians or whatever it was at the time. And it's kind of always interesting to find that stuff and think about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love, I mean, I've been out uh, hunting and find stone points, you know, and you're out there with a, with a wood bow, primitive arrows and all that stuff. And then you find this stone point that's been out there for thousands of years. And you think, you know, 5,000 years ago, there was a guy standing probably very, very close from where I am right now doing the exact same thing, trying to put meat on the table. And he's thinking the exact same thing. He's thinking, all right, where are these animals at? Where are they coming from? Which way is the wind blowing? I mean, all of these things, it's, that's a pretty cool feeling. I mean, it's just, it's so timeless. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can tap into it, even with like when I do the foraging and stuff, you just think about it and you're like, there's such a disconnection with modern day society and people not knowing plants. And there's, there's almost like a, a plantophobia or even mushrooms, the same thing, a mycelia phobia or whatever you want to call it, that, that they're just like, Oh my God, you can't eat that. What are you doing? <laughs> you're you're going to die. You're going to poison yourself. Do you know what you're doing? And, and even my wife, I'll bring home a mushroom and study it and take a spore print and do all these different things. And she's like, how do you know that's the right one? I said, well, because I followed five rules that if I can get, you know, three or four of those rules, I positively identify that I know what it is. And I mean, it's just, it's unreal to think of how far we got and anytime you can reconnect with that and anybody that does that, it's such a, like a primal feeling. And you're like, wow, this is, this is something you, in modern day society, you just, you don't sense that anymore. And that's always an amazing, amazing feeling. <laughs> But so yeah. now that you brought it up and we talked about your strings, let's talk about the napping. Cause that's something that, that probably, do you think that took you more time to get good at it than doing the bows? Well, I mean, I, I do not claim to be a flint napper. <laughs> um, I, I haven't napped a head since probably that time. Uh, and that was just a, a relatively short period where I was actually doing that stuff. And I got, I mean, I was able to make heads that I felt comfortable hunting with. I mean, they were sharp, they were, uh, they were adequate. Um, but it took me a lot of rock to get a head. You know, I, I messed up a bunch of good materials to just get one head. And when you first, that's a characteristic of all flint nappers, I think is when you first start, you just make a lot of little bitty pieces of rock and don't really have a lot to show for it. Um, but, uh, no, I, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a flint napper. No. I mean, do you, uh, so what do you do now? Do you still hunt with your, uh, stone points? You just have somebody else or what do you do? I don't, I'm not using stone points now. I'm using steel broadheads. I use tough heads. Okay. All right. And then, so you used to do all the primitive stuff. Um, and I don't know if I've actually seen any videos of you doing that, but I'm pretty sure I might've seen some pictures of you doing the whole buckskin stuff. Um, but I mean, yeah, that was that was all way before YouTube and all that stuff. I mean, I've got yeah. some old pictures of it, but I mean, the, 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 I guess you could best describe what I do now as kind of blending that modern traditional with the more primitive stuff. I mean, really the only, the only thing that I do now that's, that could be, uh, considered as primitive is, um, is the bows that I shoot. I mean, everything else is, uh, is fairly modern or modern, traditional, I guess you could call it. Yeah. So, um, I kind of wanted to ask you about 
Fen, I saw he got he got the hog. It was yeah. that a bow that he like he made that bow. You helped him make it, and then he used it to. Yeah, yeah. Both of my boys have. Well, my older boy, uh, Coy, he he has made his own bow. I mean, just totally by himself. Um, he made one last year. He was when he was ten. That was a really nice shooting bow. Uh, the bow that Finn was hunting with, he helped make that one. I, he didn't he didn't do the whole thing by himself. But uh, during this last bow building class, we just got uh, got finished with it yesterday. Uh, he was out there in the shop with us every day working on a bow, so he's well on his way to making his own. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So you want to talk a little bit about about his hog he got then, and then then I got another question for you. Yeah. So um, anybody that hasn't seen that can uh, can check out the hunt on YouTube. Uh, we made a nice little video out of it. Um, I don't know what you would search. Just uh, I don't know hog hunting little boy or something like that, and you could probably find it. Um, but we were hunting, uh, in a, in South Florida with Ryan Gill, who is, if you want to talk to a primitive guy that you need to talk to Ryan, like he's, <laughs> he's stone age, uh, hunts with that laddles and all that, all that fun stuff. But we were hunting with Ryan down there and I had shot a pig like the first evening. And so after that, I started just filming, I was carrying the camera and we were out, oh, next day or the day after. And had got into a little group of pigs uh it was real windy that day and finn was uh right beside me and i always carry a an arrow for him and when i when he when i carry an arrow for him that has a broadhead on it i always have it until something comes up then i'll hand it to him because he's you know you don't want i don't want a, a seven-year-old walking behind me with a broadhead <laughs> you know that's a good idea <laughs> so i had his arrow we got into this little group of pigs and uh, I just handed him his arrow and I turned to, you know, film Ryan and I followed him and Finn went off, uh, trail and after, uh, Vastin, who's the, the other fellow that we were hunting with. And I was, we weren't separated for two minutes and Finn comes running back up to me and saying, I shot one, I shot one. And I looked at him. I was like, you shot one? Like, really? <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, let's go, let's go see. And he was talking about um, he was talking about a, a sow with piglets that he had seen, and so I thought, well, you know, he'd shot like you know one of the little football sized piglets because sometimes those, uh, well, a lot of times those pigs will get in nests, and the sow will be laying there, and then there's a whole bunch of piglets in the nest. And I thought he had just you know shot into a nest of them and hit one. Well, we start trailing this thing, and turns out there's a, an 89 pound bar hog at the end of this trail with an arrow stuck, uh, in between its neck and its shoulder angling back into its chest cavity. And he had killed that hog with a 20 pound self bow and a little quarter inch, uh, Tonkin cane shaft with 190 grain tough head on the front of it. And I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't, I, uh, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't have been there. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. That's awesome. So, so speaking of that, what, what was your, uh, your first, uh, animal like? My first, uh, with a self bow was, a a doe in Alabama. And I remember it. Uh, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, uh, it was just getting dark and this doe came out. I was sitting in a tree stand and I was, I was hunting with, with some uh, primitive arrows that I'd made that were made out of, uh, just shoots, you know, they weren't like split or sawn shafts that you would get today. And I had uh, wild Turkey feathers on them. And so they, you know, wild Turkey feathers are very dark and they're hard to see. And it was dark enough to where I, sh when I shot, I couldn't, I couldn't really tell a whole lot about where I hit. And so I gave her a pretty good little while. Um, but when I got down and started following the blood trail, she hadn't gone, but probably 50 yards and she was piled up there. And I mean, that was, that was pretty cool to have done it with a bow that I'd made myself and an arrow that I'd made myself. I mean, that was, you know, anytime anybody ever does something like that, I don't think it's something that they'll ever forget. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about 
like the bow building aspect of it, what what's some of the biggest like snags you've ran into or mistakes you've made along the way? Um, well, I mean, I think the biggest thing that, that gets people, uh, when they're making bows is the tillering process, uh, because it is such a, it's a delicate thing, you know, and the closer you get to having a finished bow, the more careful you have to be and the easier it is to mess up because in those final stages of tillering, if you make one little mistake and make one part of the limb bend a little bit too much. Well, you can't leave that there because if you leave, that's called a hinge. If you leave that hinge there, every time you shoot that bow, that one spot is doing more work than any other spot on the bow and it'll eventually wear out. And so the way to fix that is to take wood off of everywhere else until it matches that weakest point. And when you do that, you go, you might be aiming for a 50 or a 60 pound bow, but because you have to match that weakest point, you might end up with a 30 pound bow. I think that's probably the biggest place where that, that really gets people. And I, I've done it plenty to, to know that very intimately. So is there any, anything you would recommend to like maybe try and not do that other than just, I mean, so, so let's go back, I guess when, when you're actually doing like the scraping or the, the final finish i mean are you going all the way down to like the next the next layer of the wood like the next layer of grain or how how does that work no um so you get the bow limbs bending a little bit and then you put it on a tillering rack which is a just a something on your wall that holds it and you have a pulley down towards the floor so that you can uh stand back and and pull this rope which runs through the pulley and up to the bowstring uh and see how those limbs are bending. And if you have a stiff spot, you remove wood from the belly side, which is the side that's facing you. Um, and if you have a weak spot, you mark that you don't take anything off of that. And in that way, you get the limbs bending evenly and you also get them bending on a nice arc. Now, once you get that nice arc and you bend, get them bending evenly, then you have to start working it back, working the draw length down and reducing the weight. Um, and as long as you can keep it bending evenly, you just keep removing wood until you get the draw length back, uh, and get the weight that you want. Now, a lot of people ask what thickness of my limbs, what should my limb thickness be for a certain, uh, weight of bow? And it's, it's impossible to ask that because it depends on so many different things. It depends on how long the bow is, how wide the bow is, what species of wood and things like that. And so the thickness, you just arrive there based on how much wood you need to take off to get to a, a, the draw length that you want and the weight that you want. Okay. I think once you probably do the act, it makes a little more sense than, um, you know, yeah. you, need, talk, you need to go through it. the process or, or watch some videos on it to understand yeah. it. But to real, I mean, you can watch videos and you can get a theoretical knowledge of it. But you need to actually do it. And you, you was asking about how to avoid making a hinge. Well, you, you need to make hinges, you know, to learn <laughs> how to not make hinges. Right. Have you ever made any bows out of hackberry? I've never made a bow out of hackberry. I do have a hackberry, maybe two staves uh, in the top of my barn. I've just not got around to, to trying it out yet. I've always been curious because I had a buddy that told me that hackberry i've got quite a few hackberries in the backyard and he's like man that make a pretty good some pretty good bow staves but i've never uh never messed with it kind of interesting well uh, if you're surrounded by osage <laughs> why use a I hackberry mean, <laughs> yeah, why <laughs> why even bother <laughs> right um so i'm kind of curious do I mean, you got any plans for uh any kind of hunts this year or just try and take the boys out as much as you can or what what, what are your plans yeah, I think, uh, you know, just our standard stuff. We we live up here in North Idaho. We've got uh, really good whitetail hunting around here. Uh, we always do a big elk trip, which is, you know, we could be out anywhere from two weeks to the whole month of September, uh, just depending on how long it takes me to kill an elk. Uh, but we'll <laughs> take the whole family on that. Um, and then we've got a really good late, uh, late whitetail hunt that we like to do. 
uh, where I've got some guys from Oregon that come over and um, spend some time in the backcountry doing that. So yeah, we got a pretty full, pretty full fall. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, you're going to go down to Florida, you think, and shoot a bunch of hogs or what's the plan there? Yeah, well, yeah, we'll probably, you know, the winter in North Idaho just really sucks. <laughs> and so it's, it's just dreary and overcast and uh, just drags on and on. And so, um, I don't know, we'll probably drive back down there, uh, I don't know, mid-February or uh, mid-January, maybe February, um, and then get into some pig hunting down there. There's, I mean, there's so many public land spots down there where you can hunt hogs. And southeast Georgia, uh, Alabama, all those places just ate up with hogs. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, Clay, before we go, um, if you could kind of tell people where they can find you and and uh, all the places they can find you, that'd be that'd be great. All right, yeah, you can uh, you can get on my website at uh, twistedstave.com. There's some information on the bow classes there. There's the books and the DVDs are on there. Um, some old blog posts, uh, things like that. And then there's, uh, Instagram at Clay Hayes Hunter. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, obviously. Uh, just Google Clay Hayes and you'll find it. Um, and I, uh, of course my Patreon site, if you're really into bow building and you want some super detailed stuff, uh, it's patreon.com forward slash Clay Hayes. That's about it. Awesome. Clay, I appreciate you coming on and talking to me and teaching me a few things so thank you so much well i appreciate you having me thank you once again thank you so much for listening to the publicly challenged podcast i hope you enjoyed the show and if you did please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to also if you could leave a review that would help us out and you can check us out on instagram or at publiclychallenge.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.